thank you for joining us tonight for some S N E S. That's right. This week we will be talking about the 30th anniversary of the Super Nintendo. Um, came at the end of uh, August. We didn't uh, get to talking about it because Drew is uh, wasn't a Super Nintendo player as a kid. He didn't have it. Um, he was a Sega guy. So uh, we tried to get together on something, but it's hard to do a little SNES discussion when <laughs> when you don't have it. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it later. You'll find out that I didn't always have it either. Um, before we begin, um, I've been playing Life is Strange True Colors this week. Um, I was originally going to do a full spoiler cast for True Colors. Um, I was really looking for someone to talk it out with. Um, I didn't want to do it with my wife, who we played the entire game together because we were going to have the same experiences. I was really looking for someone who had different experiences, maybe made different choices. Um, nobody wanted to talk about it. Uh, beating the game very quickly. <laughs> um, we started playing it on Thursday. Oddly, it came out Thursday. It was supposed to come out September 10th. It came out 10 a.m. on Thursday, which is interesting because I thought it was going to come out 10 p.m. I misread the map. Uh, it was in military time. So I thought 10 o'clock just meant 10 p.m. like a lot of Nintendo Switch games. Uh, this is on Xbox, but still. Uh, but it came out 10 a.m. and uh, I didn't take the day off like I have the last couple of work days. So I kind of squeezed in a little bit of time uh, during work. We actually finished chapter one on that Thursday. Uh, did chapter two and three on Friday. And then we were going to do one chapter each Saturday, Sunday. But uh, chapter four is very short. And uh, yeah, then we finished it up on Saturday by dinner. So um, absolutely loved it. I have a 30 second review for it. So go check it out on our YouTube channel. Dad's After Dark. Um, also played some Grifflands. I'll have more to talk about that next week. Very interesting game. Very complex relationship that I have with it. Um, I'm looking for a new game right now. I need something on Xbox. Um, I was kind of waiting for Life is Strange. And now that that's done, I don't want to play through Life is Strange again too soon. Um, I will be playing through it a couple more times. Um, but I need something else right now. So I'm going to take a look and see. Also excited. My son is going to go on a two week trip. Are you kidding me? A two week school trip to Washington. Uh, we live in Colorado. Um, he's going to be in Washington for two weeks. Um, going to miss the guy. Uh, he's 14 years old and he's going to be on a trip. for two weeks. I can't even imagine when I was 14, if I went on a trip for that long. I know I went on a three day trip um, as part of uh, my high school uh, as a senior. And that was the most I had ever left home by myself. I did not do well. Uh, hopefully he'll do better. But gaming wise, um, I'm going to steal his PS4 for the two weeks, steal it back. Anyway, I gave it to him last year um, and I'm excited. I'm going to finally play through Horizon Zero Dawn. I'm very excited for that. Um, very colorful, very pretty game. Um, the lead character is this is the voice of Chloe and Life is Strange. Um, just seems like my jam. I'm hoping two weeks will be enough for that game. Um, if not, I'm just going to have to hold on to it for a little longer, but I'm um, looking forward to that. So, um, yeah. But anyway, let's turn our attention here to the Super Nintendo. This was the second home console that Nintendo put out, and really the first one that was an upgrade, right? It was fine enough we had a Nintendo, um, but the first time we, we got an upgrade, it was released here in North America, August 23rd, 1991, 30 years ago. I cannot believe it. I was 14 years old in high school. I owned a Super Nintendo. I cannot for the life of me. I've been thinking about this for years. I cannot for the life of me remember getting it. I remember when I got my Nintendo Christmas morning. I remember knowing I was getting a Nintendo because I was peeking through my presents. I remember my ex getting me an N64. I remember my current wife, who was I was just dating at the time, got me a GameCube. I remember where I was when I got the Wii. Gosh, that was. Oh, man, that's crazy. 
yeah, but when I got the Wii, my wife was pregnant with our first son, um, the one going to Washington. And I remember having to wait in line for an hour and a half or so at Best Buy. I remember where I was when I got the Wii U. I remember when I was, got all my Switches. I do not remember how I got the Super Nintendo, but I did. And, um, you know, my impressions of it at the time, I had seen pictures of the uh, Super Famicom with its, you know, yellow, blue, all the the the, the primary color buttons. Uh, I remember being disappointed that we were getting one with like purple tinted buttons. But I mean, it's a it's a pretty system. Yeah, I love it. it kind of blocky. Uh, got some curves. I uh, a few years ago, um, probably a little more than a few years ago now. I bought the second model of the Super Nintendo, um, mostly because if uh, you ever look at the box of the, uh, the the second model of the Super Nintendo, it has some really crude 3D graphics on it. Um, it was around the time that, you know, they had Donkey Kong Country by that point, but they had like a 3D Bowser, you know, from Mario RPG. Um, I really love it, um, but it's not quite as pretty as the original Super Nintendo. Just a, a fabulous system. Amazing game library. Um, really one of the one of those those systems that ages really well. Um, I love my NES. Some of those games are a little, you know, they've aged a little bit. Super Nintendo games just feel like they're just modern games today. They're just incredible. Um, my best friend at the time, uh, Glenn, this was back when I lived in New York. He had a Sega Genesis. And so we had a lot of fun. Um, it wasn't a big war between us, but we had a lot of fun uh, going back and forth between each other's houses. We would do sleepovers. And uh, sometimes when he went on a vacation, he'd let me borrow his Genesis for a week. I'd bring it over. Um, but we had a lot of fun playing, you know, all the Super Nintendo games. And then we'd be at his house and be playing all the Genesis games. I remember Tommy Lasorda baseball with that outfield that was a million miles long. Um, so much fun. Sonic. I, I just remember we had a blast um, between us. But I only really had the Super Nintendo for a couple years. Strangely. Um, I bought a 3DO, if you can believe it. Um, I don't know what. I I remember really liking the CDI. I remember I had a Turbo Graphics for quite a while. I don't remember what won me over with a 3DO. But back then, full motion video was a very popular thing. And it was very easy for a kid my age to be swayed by it as if they are graphics, you know? Um, but so many of those games were playable movies where you hit buttons. <laughs> it wasn't really that fun, but man, I was really sold on the 3DO. I was working at my parents' deli. I would pull down 75 bucks a day in cash under the table, no taxes. And I was living at home and I didn't have to buy food or much of anything. Um, I didn't date when I was in high school. I didn't date until I was in college. Um, so I was saving my money in a little, uh, water bottle and, uh, yeah, 600 bucks. Um, my dad took me to the store. I think it was an egghead software. I'm not sure if that was the name of the time. And um, he didn't really know what I was buying, but I needed a ride to the store. And um, I'll always remember when he found out that the system was $600. He was trying to haggle the price down with the guy, the poor guy at the store. He can't haggle. And I was so embarrassed. I just kind of walked out of the store. Um but anyway, yeah, I had gotten to 3DO, and so I played 3DO, and I, I eventually gave my my Super Nintendo and my games um, to uh, one of the one of the one of the other guys that I was working with at the deli, and uh, yeah, I just moved on. I never never kept it. Nothing. I never really kept a lot of my my old systems and consoles. I totally regret that. Um, that was the reality. So yeah, a couple couple of years with the Super Nintendo, I missed a lot of games. Um, I just didn't play back in the day. I didn't play Super Metroid back in the day. Super Punch Out, I didn't even know existed until like five or six years ago. Um, you know, Earthbound, Super Mario RPG, I just didn't play them. And and honestly, at that time, I was not an RPG player. I was not a adventure player. I played Zelda games. I played Mario games. But mostly I had a lot of sports games in my collection. Uh, played a lot of games with my friends. Um, played a lot of games with my older brother. So, um, yeah, my collections in the past do not look anything like they do today. Like right now for the Switch, gosh, I probably have like maybe five sports games or so. A um, couple RBI titles only because I was just buying every Switch game at the time. Um, I have <laughs> Mutant League football, but really I'm not a big uh, sports game player anymore. 
um, because there's just no one who really wants to play sports games with me, um, especially locally. So what we did uh, this week is um, I put together my list of my top 10 favorite Super Nintendo games of all time. Um, to make this list interesting, there's no Mario or Zelda games. I feel like some of these lists can really fill up quickly with Mario, Zelda, a lot of the same stuff. Um, where would they rank? Both Link to the Past um, and um, uh, Super Mario World um, would definitely be in my top 10. Um, I don't know if Super Mario World 2 would be there. Uh, I didn't I didn't play it back in the day. And um, by the time I played kind of Yoshi games, there were more modern ones. Um, and so uh, the older games, I don't know, didn't age as well. Um, but certainly Super Mario World would be a probably a top fiver. Uh, Link to the Past, maybe top five, definitely top 10. Um, more so, I don't have the urge to replay it. But yeah, we're not going to include Mario and Zelda games here. Um, and I'm going to try to look at these games through the lens of of the time. Um, you know, some of these games did not age well at all. Some of them, you know, aged well, but like, they, you know, they're not quite the same. And maybe today I, I'm not like super pumped to play a game or two that ended up on my list. But at the time, these were games that I loved and I want to try to keep it focused there. It's just too easy to start picking out games that maybe aged a little better. Uh, you know, that, you know, arrow fighters or something like that, that are like, oh, this game's really good today. And it's like, well, yeah, but let's talk about, you know, back in the day. Um, and so that that's that's kind of an important part. I'm only doing one game per series. Um, this wasn't a problem for me. I didn't I didn't pick multiple, but, you know, picking all three Street Fighter games would be silly. Um, so we're just going to stick to one game per series. And, you know, I was thinking about what we dub game of the year, right? I, I just finished. I like I said, life is strange, true colors. Um, it's my game of the year for 2021 as of now, but I was thinking about like, it won't be named game of the year by, you know, IGN. It won't be named game of the year by, you know, magazines. And then I said, well, who cares? What's the difference? Um, it's it, a game of the year is individual to everybody. When I, you know, when I ask somebody, if I ask Drew, what's your game of the year? I want to know what his game of the year is, but not, you know, no, no website can tell you what the game of the year is. And just today we we're seeing, um, early reviews for death loop, um, got a 10 out of 10 from IGN, which is great. It's never going to be my game of the year. Never. It's, 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 it's a shooter. Uh, it's first person. I won't even be able to play it as much as I would like to given the reviews. Um, so these, these games are all individual. So, you know, having said that, um, this list is mine and in no way should anyone feel offended. If I, I've left something off, if something's there that you think should be there, it's probably not there for a reason. Um, there's a good chance. Maybe I just totally forgot about something. Um, it's not there for a reason. It's, it's about, you know, my life experience growing up. And, uh, you know, it's individual to me. I like offbeat games. I always have. I just told you I had a 3DO. So, <laughs> um, you know, take that for what you will. But anyway, let's get to the list. Um, we'll start with my number 10. Tecmo Super NBA Basketball. I told you I play a lot of sports games. Um, Tecmo Super NBA uh, this was a five on five basketball game um, as a kid. It had the real rosters and everything like that. Played this game so much uh, with my friend Glenn. Um, I was watching a lot of basketball at this time. I was a big New Jersey Nets fan. Um, you know, looking at this game now. I tend to favor some of the like, you know, two on two or three on three games. It's just a little bit of less clutter on the screen. Uh, what made this game great was just some of the, the quirkiness of it. One of the things was when there was a foul in the game, the, the, the game action would just end immediately. Like instead of having a little referee on the, on the screen, just kind of blow a whistle, put his hand up, you know, maybe then they show you the ref. The whole screen just goes black and you get this, you know, more realistic lo looking NBA referee telling you the, the penalty. It, it's, it was always so uh, disturbing as you're playing to just have the whole game just wipe away from the screen. Um, but I think it kind of gave it its quirkiness. It led to a lot of like utter outrage at, at these calls. Another little quirk of it was um, 
when you do free throws. I mean, you know what a free throw looks like in basketball. In this game, they just really wanted to save time and animation and maybe some storage space. And uh, you do jump shots from the foul line. It's so unnatural. It's so silly. I don't know why they couldn't just make a free throw animation. I just imagine it was a late cut as they were trying to hit a deadline. Um, but yeah, the player is just kind of shooting the ball by jumping <laughs> at the free throw line. Um, very, very bizarre. Uh, it, it's a fast playing game. Um, steals are just instantaneous. It, I mean, it, it could take you like a, a half a second to realize you don't even have the ball. And if you were really fast with the game, you could just anticipate, steal the ball and just be going for your shot before the person even knows they don't even have it anymore. Um, but some of the best memories of this game uh, with my friend were we would play uh, Celtics versus Nets. And um, our two favorite players at the time, his favorite player was Reggie Lewis. And my favorite player was Drazen Petrovic. And we would play this game. And it was, you know, we were young, constantly just feeding the ball to our favorite players. And, you know, uh, my friend would like shoot the ball and he's like, Reggie Lewis. And then, you know, he hit a three pointer and the game, the game will actually go three. Like it didn't have a lot of voice. It had a good amount, um, but it wasn't like announcing the game. But this little announcer voice would go three every time. And it was just hilarious, especially when you can hit three or four in a row and you were losing. And this annoying three just graded at you. Um, and one of the saddest parts about this game is that um, it's just kind of amazing. Um, both of our favorite players died um, within a month of each other. Um, Drazen Petrovic was killed on the Audubon in a car accident while he was sleeping um, in the passenger seat of a car. Uh, and then Reggie Lewis um, developed some heart issues the, that previous playoffs that year. He actually had collapsed on the court. Um, he got diagnosed with... Um, some heart ailments. Um, they kind of told him his career was over. Uh, he went to get a second opinion. Um, that second opinion, I, I, I don't know, you know, how kosher it was suggested that, um, his career was not over. And then he was practicing one day in, in July of 1993 and, uh, uh, collapsed on the court and died. So kind of crazy that both of our favorite players that we used to play with us in this game both died within a month. Um, it's not something that happens often with athletes, but um, yeah, Tecmo Super NBA Basketball. A whole lot of fun. Um, probably not in anyone's list. Luckily for me, this is like a $1 or $2 game generally. Um, so I do have it. I actually have all the games on this list, um, surprisingly. Um, number 10. Number 9. I'm sure this one will be a little controversial as well. The Simpsons Bart's Nightmare. Uh, I was a huge Simpsons fan in the 90s. There was a time when like half the shirts that I owned were those white Simpson shirts with Bart and Homer. Um, I used to wear them all the time. And I was a huge fan. I had a Bart Simpson phone. Um, loved it. I don't watch the show anymore. Um, not for anything other than I just don't really have the time and interest. Um, but it's always fun. But anyway, the thing I love about the Simpsons games, especially at this time, is how crazy they were. A lot of these games did something that other games just didn't do. You were in this colorful environment with all these weird characters and all that. And like every level was so different from one another. And the Simpsons, Bart, the Bart's Nightmare game was the same thing. When you start Bart's Nightmare, you're on a street. It's a two way street. Um, and you generally stay on the sidewalks. There's a bunch of Z's up on this meter at the top. And then you see a couple of them like flying through the air. You can blow bubbles. Uh, Lisa can turn you into a frog. There's mailboxes that like run across the street. If you get in the street, you might get hit by the bus, um, by that. Whoa guy, you know, uh, on the Simpsons. And it's just like, what the hell is going on? It's just so random. And it's a game, it's a level, I mean, really, that you have to play to really understand what is going on. It's just not clear. It's not like, you know, some of the other games on my list. And that's what I loved about it. And every level is so different in this game. There's nothing like you go to the second level. Nothing from the first level prepares you for what to do. You're just left to figure it all out. And it gave the game replayability. Um, not so much in its difficulty. And it was it was not an easy game. That bus, by the way, flies. Um, but just th that there's so much to figure out before you can even start to develop your skills about how to do it. 
Um, in that first level, you have to jump over the mailboxes to gain items. You really wouldn't even think that. Um, that's just the way it was. I used to love too on the NES Bart versus the Space Mutants. This is, you know, this is a very criticized game. Um, but it was the same thing that first level, especially where you have to try to cover, you know, the the aliens up or the purple things. I'm sorry, you have to cover the purple things up to protect them from the aliens. Uh, it, it just there was so many wacky ways to do it, and it was so hard. I mean, like everything was so individual. And then once the first level ends, you never see it again. And that's what I loved about these Simpsons games. Um, I, I Bart versus the Space Mutants would be a top ten on my NES list easily. Um, and same for Bart's Nightmare. I really love it. Um, I kind of just re- rediscovered it today as I was playing through my games and 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 trying to finalize my list. Um, I think I'm going to try to do a playthrough of it. I don't think I ever beat it, um, but I'm going to give it a try. Really, really fun, crazy game that I'm sure is probably in the bottom 10 of a lot of people's lists. <laughs> Number eight, Super Smash TV. This was, you know, a great co-op game when you have a, a best friend who comes over a couple times a week. Um, a great game to play with them. Um, I love the controls of this one. The D-pad was, you. well, I mean, if you've never played this game, maybe you haven't. I mean, it came from the arcade. It's like this mock game show, and you just go through rooms and just shoot the hell out of shit. That's what it is. And it really was one of the first, like, looter games where you're just shooting a bunch of stuff, and there's cash and prizes just coming down um, and weapons and all that. And it's just, you're just grabbing everything, and it's just a total blast. There's a lot of games like that today. Um, that you play and and you just you just it's just a free for all just picking stuff up and going and and um, this was one of the first there was a version on the NES that I bought one time thinking it was this one but no the Super Nintendo one is is superior in every way and it's it's dumb and it's grindy and it's aged a little bit you know sometimes you go into rooms and the the host has to come on and he he has little lines to say it's part of the charm of the game but it also kind of slowed down the game too so he might come on and say I'd buy that for a dollar but man, it's just fun with two player and it's super hard. There's no way I beat this game and it had bosses. Um, you went through rooms. I don't think it was randomized at the time. I am pretty sure it wasn't randomized, um, but there was bosses in each little section. Um, I'd love to try to like get through this game, probably just like on easy mode. Um, if I could figure out how to convince one of my kids to play with me. Um, but I really love this game. love the co-op. Uh, definitely a much better two player game than one player game. Um, definitely give it a try if you haven't before. It's, um, I don't know how popular it was, but it was great. All right. Number seven. This is the first game on my list that I didn't play as a kid. I played as an adult and, um, it's on my list. Uh, Super Castlevania four. Um, never knew it existed. I remember playing through this game about eight years ago before we moved into our house. We, we, we were getting a new house and we were living in an apartment for a few months. And I kind of cramped in at the time uh, with our three kids. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, Super Castlevania 4. I think this is supposed to be like a remake of the first game. But honestly, it's a Castlevania game. Who cares? Um, it doesn't look like the first game. Doesn't feel like the first game. Maybe I'm confusing it with Super Cast- with Castlevania 3. I don't know. Um, but this game is just such a pleasure in its own right. Amazing mood. Um, the music in this game is incredible. I, I'm i kind of iffy on Super Nintendo. There are some games, you know, the Super Nintendo has a certain sound. Um, the, you know, when I think of the Nintendo, I think of regular sound. If we just make that the baseline. Super Nintendo just had sort of like a little reverby. They they got a little fancy in some of the games. They have they have similar sounds. In some games, I can't stand it. But wow, in Castlevania 4, it's amazing. The mood is great. And Castlevania games are I generally think of them as, you know, platformers, that sort of thing. But there's a lot of diagonal platforms here. There's a lot of variety. They use some mode seven um, on one of the levels where you're spinning around. Um, the whip. This in this game is the one where the whip you can kind of whip up to the sides and then you can kind of leave it free form and kind of just how do you do it? They like whip it around. Um, so good. I remember uh, you can go through some of the castles like there'd be these um, like uh, like iron walls behind you and you'd be able to go through doors and go to the other side. Um, I think that was the first time in a Castlevania game where you can 
you had kind of two sides of the screen like Mario World. Um, it wasn't super hard. I didn't beat the original Castlevania until about 10 years ago. I could never get past Dracula. And most times when I played, I couldn't get past the Grim Reaper. Um, this game I was able to play through, I think, in just a day. Um, not as hard. It's still a hard game, but it wasn't as impossible to me as the uh, the original. Um, just a great game. I, I It's probably my favorite Castlevania, um, even if the first one has so much nostalgia for me. It's just it's just a really good time. And I didn't play many Castlevania games after it, really. Uh, once it went 3D, I never touched the 3D games. They look terrible. Um, you know, but yeah, it's a great game. Love it. Number six, Contra 3 Alien Wars. Again, another game I did not play as a kid. I played this when I grew up. Wow. I really love Contra 3. Um, if it, it feels so much like the original, I know games evolve as they go. This one feels so much like the original, especially that first level where you go through and it's like, oh, the weapons come in on the top and all that. The the one, I think, tweak in this game was you can have two weapons at a time. It wasn't always super intuitive. Um, if you had like, if we call them an A weapon and a B weapon, um, if you were holding your A weapon and you got a new weapon, it would replace your A weapon. Um, so it's not like it was like the last two weapons you picked up or something. Uh, but it was great. You can always try to keep a spread gun because the spread gun is the best weapon in the game. And I think they realize that, you know, they're when you play the first Contra, the spread will just get you far. You know, it, it kills so many weapons, weapons one time. You know, the, the laser can be more powerful at times, um, but for the most part, the spread is just kind of the general, always powerful weapon. And here you can have a second weapon. So like, you know, if you have, you know, heat seeking missiles or laser and, and, you know, you can put used to that, you can hold them. And where those might become effective, you can switch to them. So it adds some strategy to the game. Um, there are some levels here that are overhead. Um, they took advantage of mode seven. Everybody used mode seven. Um, it, you know, it just kind of made it. It made your game unique in a way. Um, but it was also part of like their marketing strategy. And every every game wanted to see what they can do with mode seven. And Contra was no different. They had these overhead levels where you were literally looking straight down on top of their heads. And um, you use the L and R buttons on the controller to spin the camera. And you always kind of shot in the direction you were. Um, it wasn't the best control, but, you know, we didn't have analog sticks at the time. And they tried something different. Um, nowadays, I, I have trouble with those levels. Um, they, the spinning happens a little too fast for my take. <laughs> I'm going to lose my lunch over it. Um, but a great game. I put this one slightly ahead of Castlevania. I mean, I always love the, the Konami games. I think Konami was one of the best developers of the, the early Nintendo generations. Um, I put it a little bit above because, you know, this is a game that's fun to play two player. You can play it with my kid, can play it with my wife. Um, didn't play it with my friend because I didn't really play it until I was an adult. But uh, playing this kind of game with two players is just so much fun. I think it gives it, it it's always given Contra a little leg up on the Castlevania series. Um, but man, can't go wrong with either game. Both fantastic. Number five, um, this is a game that everybody's going to have on their top 10 list. Uh, mine kind of fell in the middle. Uh, Turtles in Time. This was the fourth Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game. Um, and easily the best one. Uh, such a great arcade port. Um, all the turtles were so individual. Lots of uh, sound clips. I mean, there's nothing I can really say about this that nobody doesn't know already. Um, I, the reason why it's number five for me, for one thing, I have always found this game incredibly hard um, on normal mode. I just could never get to the end. There's just too much naggy stuff on the screen. Um, it's hard to stay clean and unhit. Um, I finally did beat this game several years ago just by putting it on easy mode. I just decided one day I was like, I want to see the end of this game. <laughs> I'm tired uh, of dying all the time, usually late in the game or to shredder. Um, so I put it on easy mode just to see it can be a bit of a grind. There's 10 levels in the game, but the levels are pretty long and you keep fighting these same uh, foot soldiers all the time. So, I mean, by the time you get to the end of it, you're just a little sick and tired of it. There's some good variety in the levels, um, but between how long the levels are and how you fight a lot of the same enemies over and over and over again, 
And, you know, when you die and you got to start all over from the beginning, um, it does feel a bit grindy. Um, I love the voice, um, the voice in the game. Um, I, I, I can I can anytime I need to hear it in my head, uh, you know, Big Apple 3 a.m., you know, and when the turtles in the uh, the water level and, you, you know, they get hit and like, my toe, my toe. I mean, so good. One one <laughs> understated thing about this game. Does anybody have a pizza strategy like when you're playing? I mean, really any kind of like one of these brawling games, but. You know, you see the big pizza on the on the screen. And when you're a kid, you're just gravitated to it. I got to go get the pizza. But if you really, you know, you get older, or you become strategic. You start to learn, like, don't grab the pizza until we fight all the enemies in the screen. And the pizza is going to scroll off the screen, right? Like, if you pick up a pizza. I hope I have this right. But when you when you finish a level in turtles in time, if you had even one bar of health, you will have full health by the next bite. I think that's right. And so that's always a factor. But if you see a pizza and you have half health and you pick it up, you're going to have full health. Great. But wouldn't it be nice to use up as much of that half health as you can before you pick up the pizza, because either way you're going to fill up your bar. So you try to like, you know, get more bang for the buck. Um, I think as kids, you know, you're always kind of running and grabbing the pizza I, it's it's really kind of like math. It's like a way to learn math as a kid. Um, but like, you know, and did you share it with your friend? Did you did you decide, oh, their health is lower. They should take this pizza. Or did you decide oh, I'm better and, and I should take this pizza? Um, I think the pizza strategy is one of the most interesting parts of this game um, as you're kind of like going through these guys. It's just it's such a great port, such a great game. Um, but yeah, I'm putting it at a five. Number four is another game that's probably on everybody. I, I think I think most of the rest of these games are on everybody's top 10, um, especially the next one too. NBA Jam. Now, I, I'm i pretty sure I played regular NBA Jam as a kid. Um, I have the tournament edition too. Um, I'm just going to call it NBA Jam because the, the basic NBA Jam was already so good. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to call it there. This is clearly the best basketball game of all time. So much fun. I mean, so many quarters in the arcades. So when this game came out on uh, Super Nintendo, um, it, it, it saved me money buying it. Um, NBA Jam it owes a lot of its success to uh, its rubber banding mechanic, which I think as kids, we didn't really know existed. We kind of intuitively knew. Um, but the bigger the lead you had, uh, bestowed a bigger advantage for your opponent. So if you, you know, if you could rake up like a, a 12 to 15 point lead in NBA jam, your opponent could basically hit three pointers from the, um, the other side of the court. It always made the game close. Um, very rarely did you play a game of NBA jam where you were just blowing away your opponent. And whenever the game was close and you would win, it would lead to throwing more quarters in and playing again, because wow, what a game that was. I'll get you next time. Um, so it was great marketing strategy for the game. And of course, the codes. I mean, <laughs> I could play NBA Jam all day long. Uh, the Super Nintendo version had a bunch of codes, just like the arcade had codes and later games would. And you could like add different characters to the game. I mean, I mean, this game came out, what, like 93, 94 or whatever. Uh, you know, you could play as Bill Clinton and Al Gore, which is hilarious. Um, Warren Moon is in this game. There is a lot of characters in this game that I think are just because the developers like them. Warren Moon, somebody had to be an Oilers fan. Warren Moon was a great quarterback, uh, but he's just randomly in this basketball game as a code. Um, there was actual developers you could play as in the game. There's codes for the developers. There is a kid named Air Dog. People don't even know who this is. It's probably like a kid of, you know, a child of one of the developers or something. I don't know. Maybe make a wish. I have no idea. Um, there in the game, uh, Carol Blazajowski, she was a 70s basketball star, you know, way before WNBA and before, you know, women's basketball was, you know, popular. Um, she played women's basketball and she was the one of the greats, if not the great at the time. And they put her in, which I think was really cool because she's an actual basketball player, unlike Warren Moon. Um, and if you think this is a series from the past, uh, the NBA Jam on fire edition. I got it. When did I buy that? Five or six or seven years ago, I bought that because we were having company over uh, my family and I really wanted to play NBA Jam. And yeah, there's the on fire edition is the newer version. It's kind of like 
Xbox 360 PS3 era. Unbelievable. It, it, it retains all of the joy of NBA Jam. Um, the graphics are updated. It looks great. Oh, man. Steph Curry, LeBron James. Um, I, 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 I really wish they would bring that back out again on Switch or something. Um, but yeah, NBA Jam is legendary. Quite possibly the best sports game of all time. Just objectively. Uh, amazing. My number three is going to another another super obvious one on this list. Street Fighter 2 Turbo Hyper Fighting. Um, if you're a kid my age, I'm in my 40s. Um, I would say if you're like late 30s or in your 40s, you know that arcades got taken over by Street Fighter 2. Um, my arcade they used to go to was uh, Nathan's. This was in Yonkers, New York, where I was growing up. And, um, you know, Nathan's is a, a very famous you know, hot dog place. Um, you can buy Nathan's hot dogs in the supermarket. Um, they do the, um, they host the, the 4th of July hot dog eating contest. We had a huge Nathan's restaurant in Yonkers and I mean, monstrous. And it, it really grew my love for just hiding in the corner of a, a, a giant place. I like to park in the corners of huge parking lots that are empty. Um, there had to be like a, over a hundred tables, maybe not over a hundred, maybe close to a hundred tables in this Nathan's. It was huge. And on any given day, you could go there and, you know, it's never going to be super crowded. It was always w way too big. Um, just buy some hot dogs, sit in the corner, relax. But they had a huge arcade connected to it. And my friend and I would go here all the time. And yeah, my, you know, in an arcade, most of the time there's one of every game. But, you know, when Street Fighter came along, there was one, then there was two, then there was four. By the, I mean, at some point there was like 10 of them lined up next to each other and they would all be packed. Um, just it's the defining game of my generation, my, that, that, that part of my generation. I can't say my generation with, with so many games, but, um, a defining game. So when it came out to super Nintendo, again, it saved you money to buy it. Um, there was a few versions of street fighter two on the super Nintendo. There was like an original which only had, I think, eight characters to play with. And it's super slow. I, it's just not playable today anymore. But Street Fighter 2 Turbo Hyper Fighting um, lets you play a lot faster. You could turn up the speed. It was way more fun to play faster. You can play as the bosses and Bison, all of those guys, Vega. Um, yeah, it's just fantastic. Nothing wrong with this game. Sounded great. Sounded just like the arcade. It was a, it was a perfect port. Um, the only frustration with it was the Super Nintendo controller did have six buttons, but two of those were shoulder buttons. Um, and the defaults, so weird, the default controller layout had the um, the light and medium punches and kicks on the main four buttons, and then put the heavy controls on the top. I never understood that, because as a Street Fighter player, I mostly used the heavy attacks. Um, I love the crossover kicks, when you jump over a guy and kind of like kick him with your butt, if that makes sense. Um, so I always had to change my controls. I always found that very frustrating. I don't know why they didn't do heavy and light or heavy and medium on the regular buttons just by default. And then just threw the, you know, the other one on the top. Um, so I always had to change my controller layout, which was really annoying, but, uh, legendary game still totally playable today. I I'm still a street fighter two guy. I don't like playing the games that kind of went 3d, um, I like the, the older street fighter games and that's why there's so many anniversary editions, people like me. Um, so that's my number three. Number two, let's get weird. My second favorite super Nintendo game of all time is WWF Royal Rumble. I don't know if you had this game. I don't know if it was popular. But uh, my friend at the time, friend and I at the time were were wrestling fans. He was a super wrestling fan. He knows everything. He knows all their real names and all that stuff. I was more casual, but I loved wrestling. And this came out in the heyday of, you know, Viking wrestling, Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, all those guys. So Royal Rumble was one of the first games that I can remember where it wasn't just a one on one wrestling match. Um, people were looking for options, differences. You wanted steel cage fights and all kind of like the crazy stuff. Royal Rumble was fun because you would play this game and every 30 seconds or a minute, I mean, it's definitely faster than the normal Royal Rumble. Uh, another wrestler can, would come in. And at some point you could have five or six or seven wrestlers in the screen. 
And it was so much fun because in most wrestling games, what is it about? It's about starting the match and wearing the other guy down, wear him down, wear him down. Uh, pro wrestling, you know, you got to do some, some potty slams, you, gotta, <laughs> you know, and then eventually you can work yourself up to suplexes and pile drivers. And then eventually you'll hear a signal and then like, you can try to go for a pin in Royal rumble. Anything can happen. Wrestlers are running across the screen. You could like fling them out. Um, you could just wear them down. You can throw them out. There's just so many ways to go about it. And it was so much fun. Um, this game had one control tweak that I thought really turned it amazing. Most wrestling games, when you wanted to run, maybe you want to, maybe if you threw somebody off the ropes and you wanted to kind of run and do a clothesline or something, you had a double tap. And double tapping, I mean, that was very common in games, you know, for whatever reason, if you wanted to run, you double tapped. Um, so, the, you know, wrestling games weren't the only one. The problem with double tapping is sometimes it can be tricky to do, especially on, you know, based on the player. Um, some people can double tap easier than others. It's not a very accessible thing to do. Um, it was also error prone. You know, sometimes you do it and you just didn't run. Sometimes you did it and you did run. Um, it wasn't always reliable. Uh, and it took some time to do, even if you could do it quickly, like it took some time to do in this game running, you just press Y. So you can be like walking towards somebody. And next thing you know, without like giving it away by, you know, tap, 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 and like hearing the person do it, you can just run and just smack them. It also made it hilarious because in this game, because it was so easy to run, you could very easily just kind of larry at somebody out of the ring. Um, and some of my favorite Royal Rumble matches with my friend were literally us starting in the ring. And like a second and a half later, you fling your friend out of the ring and he's out of the Royal Rumble a second and a half and the game is over. And then my friend would like just go hit the reset button. You're like, no, we're doing this again. You know, so it's just so much fun. Um, a lot of great wrestlers are, are, you know, in here. Ted DiBiase, who I always found hilarious. The Earthquake. Um, I was playing this game earlier today and the narcissist is in the game. I don't even remember the narcissist. I think he had another name, but, uh, yeah, there, there, there was definitely like a wrestler too. It was like, who's that? Uh, macho man, very popular. So, and the characters looked, they were colorful and very unique on the screen. Um, some of the older games, they would just do palette swaps for the most part. Um, but these were very unique wrestlers. Um, the earthquake was legit huge, um, so much fun. And it wasn't hard to play. They also had the wrestler health on the screen as well as, you know, when you're, you're like playing a wrestling game and you're tapping, tapping, tap, 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 they would show the meter. It was like a two sided meter. And if you were tapping faster, it would kind of start throbbing towards you. So it gave you a visual indication of how you were doing. Um, I loved pro wrestling on NES but it was completely blind. If you were tapping the button really fast and sometimes you wouldn't get the move off, you didn't know why. Um, you never had energy. I mean, you can hear some alerts, like they like play little alerts, but like it's nice to see the, the energy. It makes the game feel more legit. Like it's not cheating you. It's showing you what's happening. Um, for some people, it probably gives too much away, um, but I really loved it. And I really, I really enjoyed the Royal Rumble format. You didn't have to play the Royal Rumble format, by the way, um, because it did, it felt less grindy. So it was a good time. All right. My number one Super Nintendo game of all time. My favorite, not the best. My favorite is SimCity. Where are you, Tim? I know Tim loves this game, too. Um, what, what, what's there not to say? The original SimCity, um, the reason why this game is still my favorite is because the original SimCity had a simplicity um, that kind of left the series fairly early. Um, I played Sim City to death on my Super Nintendo. I would leave my Super Nintendo running sometimes throughout the school day when it was advantageous, uh, when I needed to raise some money or whatever. I definitely didn't have <laughs> disasters on. Um, but I just I still to this day love it. The the original strategy in Sim City of building donuts. So that is to say, if you're building a residential area, you build eight squares of residential area and then you put maybe a park in the middle um if you're building a you know a business area um that you know uh you, you would build a, a donut and then maybe you'd put a police department in the area um i still love that format and then putting all your donuts together with roads and then eventually replacing the roads with railroads um 
I like I liked when these games weren't that complicated. And, you know, maybe the variety is not there. I mean, the, the more stuff you can do, obviously, the more variety there is. But I just I just love the calmness of starting a new city and building my donuts. And, you know, sometimes I wouldn't even build roads. I just go with railroads. Um, you know, I just like I want to build a super clean city. Right. I love it. I did enjoy SimCity 2000, but I think I think once 2000 passed, the game started to get a little more complicated. I probably had computers that couldn't handle the newer ones. Um, even today, the, <laughs> the city building games, I like it when they run smoothly. I don't need the complexity. I want frame rate and calmness. Um, and this was that game for me. I just I just really love it. It has one of the biggest Super Nintendo manuals you've ever seen. Um, I do have the manual and I actually keep it near my Super Nintendo downstairs. Um, this is very much the most computer game on the Super Nintendo. It's amazing it's even on there. And I think there's a really great story behind how it got on there and how fast they did it. Um, but this is a game that's usually not on consoles, especially at that time. Um, and it's my favorite game. I love it. So that's it. Uh, a few honorable mentions. Um, NHL 93. Uh, sorry, Chris, not NHL 94. NHL 93. Um, that was the game that I played the most with my friend. Uh, not my friend. I'm sorry, my brother. Um, my, my friend didn't really play hockey with me. Um, but we played that all the time. And so I have a fondness for NHL 93, even more than 94. Um, Donkey Kong Country, which, gosh, was probably as close as anything to getting on this list. It's probably my number 11. Really love that game. Oddly, never played two and three in the series. I don't know why. But now that I say it, I think I'm going to make a point of doing that. I have a, a nice little Super Nintendo set up downstairs. It's time to get back into it. I know I've beaten Donkey Kong Country, but I never played two and three. Um, I really would like to. And I know it's on Switch Online, but I just like playing these games on a real square TV. Am I the only one? I, I don't like playing four by three games on a, on a large screen. Um, give me, I have a Trinitron, an old, really heavy Trinitron downstairs. That's where I want to play these kinds of games. So maybe, maybe I'll make it a, a point to play one, two, and three. Um, Sunset Riders, that's definitely a game I did not play until I got older. Um, but that game's a whole mess of fun. I wish I had that game as a kid. Um, that game's a, a, a great deal of fun. And, and, uh, you know, in some ways it, it, it deserves to be there. Maybe it's number 12. And then Final Fantasy 3, which is actually Final Fantasy 6, um, but is marketed as 3. Um, both 2 and 3 are really good, but but um, Final Fantasy 6 is, is, you know, easily my favorite Final Fantasy game. And um, yeah, it, it's just great on the Super Nintendo. Not a game that I play. <laughs> I'm going to play again. Um, but uh, yeah, I really like that one. So give it a mention. And that's it. Before I go... I want to apologize for last week's episode. Um, when I read off the games that were coming up over the next couple of weeks, I missed a whole bunch of them. I don't know how. There were some late editions from um, the indie world. I just missed them. Um, and so I did want to add these back in um, now, uh, since none of them have passed. Um, so I'll read these off. September 16th. What is that? That's a Thursday? That's a weird. That's a weird data release right september 16th we're getting eastward i mean it's a really cool game they showcase this at the uh, the indie direct the indie world um but yeah eastward um i'm really interested in that one i'm very interested in that one i'm not sure if i'll get it on day one but i'm i'm really interested in that one um looks great and that that's from chucklefish and they always they always publish really good stuff there's also Poker Pretty Girls Battle Texas Hold'em. I just mentioned that because this is the Dads After Dark and I feel like it's appropriate. I also expect Jesse to play that game and give us a review. So um, yeah, Poker Pretty Girls Battle <laughs> Texas Hold'em. You can't go wrong. Uh, September 16th as well, we're finally getting Skatebird. That's a game I feel like we've been seeing for about 10 years. Um, Skatebird's coming out. On the 17th, we're getting Nino Kuni 2 Revenant Kingdom Prince's Edition. I loved Nino Kuni when I played it on the PS3 about eight or nine years ago. Um, I thought about getting two because I, I haven't been able to get two. Um, never really had the desire to get two. Um, I, I might. 
Um, but if I do it, I'm going to play through Nino Kuni again. And because I just don't, I, I don't know if the stories connect, but it's just been so long. I feel like I need to play Nino Kuni one again, but I'm also not motivated to replay Nino Kuni one. I hated the ending of that game. Very pretty game, but I hated the ending of it. And long RPGs are not always my favorite thing to do. So I don't know if I'm going to play it or not, but I was a huge Nino Kuni fan. I have stuffies. I have the Japanese version of the game for DS. I love Nino Kuni. Um, and my wife actually played through it a few years ago. So, and then Toem. This is an indie game I have been looking forward to. Also coming out on the 17th. Um, definitely take a look at that one. That's the black and white looking photo game. Um, I'll definitely be playing this. Like I said, not, I'm not sure about day one, but um, Toem looks like it could be a really fun game to play. I can't believe I missed all these games. I mean, uh, maybe them Poker Pretty Girls. I understand why I missed. Um, but I did want to mention it because I, I felt bad when I had realized that I had screwed that up. So. So there you go. Um, hope you enjoyed my list. Let me know what you think of my list. Um, like I said, don't blame me. Um, but any of these games, especially these fringier ones, any super Tecmo Super NBA basketball fans out there, anybody like the Simpsons games? Um, let us know. But until next week, take us away, Sadie. The Dads After Dark show is a part of the Nintendo Dads family of podcasts. You can subscribe to us anywhere podcasts are available, including iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. Be sure to join us on the Nintendo Dads Discord in the Dads After Dark Show channel for some naughty After Dark talk. Follow us on Twitter at NDadsAfterDark. Ask us a question, and we may answer it on the show. That's all for tonight. Good night, Dads. Sweet dreams.